And we are live. Let's see. I have JB's here and Seth Rich already discussing how this scope compares to others. Good. Uh, that's what we're here for. As uh, people join, I know there are already a few watching. Uh, let's do this. Uh, the scope I want to talk about today is the Vortex Razor HDLHT 4.5 to 22 by 15. Uh, please put somewhere in the comments if you're watching this live uh, whether you can hear me. You should be able to. Uh, tell me if you can. Anyhow, so uh, assuming that you guys can indeed hear me, let's do this. Normally, I ask you to add uh, comments in. Excellent. So JB is always there. can hear you. Dan is here. Joe. Joe's being funny. And Facebook, Jamie is watching on Facebook. He can hear me as well. If anybody is watching on uh, Odyssey, let me know. I am um, the way streaming to Odyssey works is that I don't have immediate feedback of what's happening. So we'll see. And all right, we've got audience from all over the world. Good morning to you too, Mr. Olive. All right, let's do this. Um, I've been messing with the scope for about six months now, uh, maybe a little more, around six months. Uh, hold your questions on what it is, how it compares, and how it stacks up for a few minutes. Um, let me basically give you a summary, what I've been up to, what I think of it. And then based on that, uh, we'll open it up to Q&A and ask, uh, ask away. I am going to keep this going for as long as I can. Um, probably not too long. I found some other zombie virus. I uh, was sick the whole week, just a couple of days out of bed, and my throat hurts like hell. So uh, there's only so much talking that I'll uh, be able to do. I hope that works for you guys. And let's get the ball rolling. So the scope you see right there in the middle is the vortex rays hdlht with a sunshade that's why it looks so tall otherwise it's a fairly compact scope the rifle on the bottom there is uh, the fixed by q that's the rifle this scope sits on and to sort of give you an idea of what i think of it it's gonna stay in that gun and i like that combination so much Normally, I use the fix uh, to test scopes, but I like this combination so much that the scope is going to stay in the fix, and I'm going to get another fix to test scopes, since I like the gun uh, overall. Uh, the skull and horns you see um, uh, you see at the top of the image is that exact uh, order sheep uh, that... Uh, that I shot with that gun and with that scope. And to the best of my knowledge, it was the first kill ever done uh, with that scope. Definitely not the first uh, with the fixed uh, rifle. Okay. Other scopes I added in there sort of to give you an idea are other quote-unquote uh, crossover designs. And what I mean by crossover designs are rifle scopes that I can, without uh, much of a stretch, use for competition, let's say an RL Hunter, you know, practical precision shooting, practical long range uh, precision shooting, and equally comfortably uh, put it on a hunting rifle. Now, when I'm saying hunting rifle, I'm not talking about something I'm gonna take to the brush, you know, to shoot at fast moving things from 20 yards away, uh, general purpose hunting and the Western mountain hunting things where uh, you'll run into everything from 50 yards on out, and, and something like that, right? All of these scopes have low end magnification of 5x or lower, so they are perfectly usable off hand standing for fairly quick shooting, uh, but then, but these are not brush scopes. Now, in a pinch of your have to, you can use anything for anything, right? Uh, but these are decidedly not uh, brush scopes. What you got there from the left is the Schmidt and Bender Ultra Short, uh, 5 to 20 by 50, Tangent Theta. TT315M, 3 to 15 by 50, March, uh, 3 to 24 by 52, March, uh, 4 and a half to 28 by 52, and uh, ele uh, Element uh, Nexus, 5 to 20 by 50. 
of all of these scopes, the new vortex is decidedly the lightest. And that uh, makes a significant uh, difference. So I'm going to grab the HDLHT and start talking more about that. All right. Okay. HDLHT. I will uh, remove the sunshade. It still has some dust on it. I didn't clean everything off particularly well. And I came back from Texas. I cleaned the lenses. I didn't um, really wipe everything off. This is what the scope looks like in terms of length. Let's um, let's grab a tangent. And uh, I'll show you how it compares lengthwise. So tangent is a notably uh, longer scope, right? 3 to 15 by 50, 4 and a half to 22 uh, by 50, say, objective diameter. Uh, before we talk about comparisons, so let's uh, look a little bit at the controls and how it is set up and things like that. Oh, by the way, so I do have uh, the odd mount caps on it, you know, front and back. Um, they are almost identical to the ones uh, uh, John uh, makes for the 3 to 15 by 50 HDLHD, but they're not identical. So it is a different model. I don't know if he has them on the website, but he has a design so he can make them. The controls, magnification, nothing interesting. Um, Sight focus down to 25 yards, so it will work on the new fires and stuff in a pinch. Illumination is push button, so you kind of cycle through different levels. If it, uh, you turn it off and turn it back on, it comes back to where, uh, where it started. The windage turret, like on the rest of the HD LHD scopes, is covered, right? And for me, that works fine. The scope like this, I touch it once when I'm setting it. And beyond that, I never dial for window with hold. And the elevation turret is like an other HDLHT designs in a sense that it's a locking. So you pop it up. Here you can rot uh, you can move it. And there is a vortex's rev something, a zero stop, right? And what that uh, what that zero stop does is it limits you to just a hair under two revolutions. Each revolution of the turret is six milliradian. So you basically have 12 milliradian. The, the zero stop does allow you to go a half a milliradian under zero, which a lot of people like. Um, whatever works fine for me. I like the turret. The clicks are very distinct and the feel is quite good. They are not very clicky. They're sort of thunky, if that makes sense. They're nicely tactile, they're not loud, which is not necessarily a bad thing for hunting scope. Um, the overall dimensions and size of the turret is pretty convenient. I spent a lot of time messing with this thing. It always struck true. And most importantly, I didn't have to stare at the turret. I never got lost counting clicks and never had any real issues with it. The main tube is 30 millimeter, like uh, the rest of the hunting oriented uh, Razor rifle scopes. The big thing about this is it weighs less than 22 ounces, 21.7, I think. And in terms of the overall length, it's, I think, right uh, uh, around 13 inches, just under. Okay. So it is a nice, compact, and lightweight scope. Okay. You will see me come back to weight a, uh, a good bit. Right. Um, why? We live in a market in a world uh, that is very saturated with nice scopes, and uh, that's a good thing. But all of the almost most most of the various uh, precision tactical oriented scopes have been getting uh, decidedly chunky. They are not light. They are not small. Some are small fairly compact and really not light, right? For example, the, let me show you. Uh, this uh, Schmidt uh, 520 by 50 uh, ultra short, 
which is decidedly shorter than the vortex or the tangent or whatever else. So, so this is about 10 ounces heavier than this, if I, if I remember correctly, or 12, something like that. It's a substantial weight difference. It doesn't really matter on a competition rifle. It doesn't matter that much on a precision rifle. But if I have to lug this rifle up a mountain, it really matters. And this whole category of fairly lightweight and full-featured front focal plane scopes has been kind of... Uh, undeserved in my opinion. Okay, let me make sure I don't drop this thing at some point. It has to go back to Schmidt. I don't want to pay for it. Okay. Where was I? Yeah. Mechanically, I have no real complaints. Um, everything works, everything tracks. I've uh, spent a ton of time running the turrets when actually shooting and i've spent quite a lot of time running the turrets in front of the column major uh, what you see over there this gray inclined thing where there is an arc and scope sitting right now uh, that is a column major i can use to test tracking indoors and i can do it again and again and again and again without having to go anywhere that really helps when you're trying to see uh, how the turrets wear in stuff like that i found nothing really uh, to complain about with this thing, uh, which is, uh, I don't want to say it's unusual. With high-end scopes, it's not unusual, right? Um, but I usually find something. Mechanically, uh, I got nothing. Everything worked. The eyepiece is not of the fast focus variety. That's uh, one of the things that allows you to keep it a little bit lighter. It's, uh, you know, there's a lock ring, and then you rotate like an old-style eyepiece. But the image circle, this dark image circle, a uh, dark ring about around the images. I mean, it's not non-existent. You know where the image is, but it's really, really minimal. Uh, it's very difficult uh, to find much of anything really to complain about. The field of view is not particularly wide. It's not narrow. It's about par for the course. Uh, for uh, good quality Japanese scopes, it's definitely not as wide as the you know, Razor Gen 2 or uh, Tangent Theaters or a few, a few other designs. And that is one of the uh, trade-offs you get for having a long eye relief. And remember, this is a uh, scope that's going to go on a lot of hunting rifles, so it has to have a good eye relief. And um, without going to humongous eyepiece, and once you go to humongous eyepiece, uh, everything else starts changing, and you you end up with a uh, substantially larger rifle scope. To me, the trade-off was worth it. Optically, other than that, other than the field of view being mid-pack, right? Except it's not narrow; it's perfectly reasonable, but it's not as wide as some of the. Uh, uh, some of the new designs, and uh, if you look at, for example, uh, this uh, tangent, tangent also has shorter eye relief. Let me see if I can, sh right, and substantially wider field of view. Will you be able to see it here? No, you won't be able to see it here because of the rear cap is I'm gonna make it look the same because of, you know, the camera is not where the eye is. But uh, look at so can you see it? Yeah, look at the diameter of the eyepiece. This is the new HDLH sheet. This is a tangent, right? That makes a big difference, okay? And that adds to the weight. The tangent is very swelled given what it is. At 27 ounces, uh, this sucker is uh, under 22. And that's sort of a detail. Okay. Going back to optics with the field of view having been covered. Uh, what is exceptional, what is not. Overall resolution, especially in the center field of view, and the sweet spot is pretty large, is really exceptional given the price. I think the map and the scope is uh, right around 1,500 bucks. And the center field performance is really, really, really good. The edges are less good. I can see the deterioration, but it does not jump out at me. What that means is that if I spend a lot of time really staring through the scope at different things, I can easily tell that the edges are not as good. I can tell that more or less any scope. But when I am using it, the edge deterioration, distortion, all this sort of stuff does not jump out. Distortion is generally very nicely controlled, better than most. 
but uh, uh, that is to be expected, right? So if the design does not have a very wide field of view, one of the benefits of that, <coughs> pardon me, my throat's killing me. For all you <coughs> wise asses out there, this is Pellegrino, mineral water. Uh, where was it? Uh, yeah. One of the uh, side effects of keeping the field of view moderate is that distortion is comparatively easier to correct, right? And this is uh, evident in the scope. Distortion is really minimal. And that's one of the interesting things that really helps you uh, when you uh, when you are looking at it on low magnification, right? Since I used it also as a hunting scope, I spent quite a lot of time with it shooting on lowest power on four and a half, right? And um, uh, when you do that, when you're standing, your head's moving, everything's kind of moving. If there is significant distortion in the eyepiece, uh, you will see it. And this scope does not have it. It's a very, very comfortable scope to use on low magnification. When we talk about overall optical performance, once you get past uh, distortion and you know, things like that, we talk about resolution, we talk about contrast, uh, we talk about uh, chromatic aberration, uh, we talk about color cast and things like that. Uh, sadly, there isn't a whole lot to report. It is a mid to high end Japanese uh, scope with really good optical performance. Like many Japanese designs, it leans a little bit more toward resolution than contrast. Uh, but honestly, uh, in terms of contrast from the OEM that makes this, this is one of the better designs that I've seen. The resolution is very good. Contrast is very, very respectable. It doesn't have that like a pop that you get with a you know, $3,000 Magnus, but it's not muted either. It's a very, very natural color rendition. There is no real color cast uh, that I can easily detect, at least uh, uh, not to my eye. And the way the contrast is rendered, it is very accurate. It's a good balance between micro contrast, subtle shades, and having a strong pop on the primary colors. One of the sort of easier ways to see how well the scope carries contrast through difficult lighting conditions is to simply um, set up as the sun starts fading and as the light gets lower, you keep using it, uh, shooting, uh, looking through the scope, and you just go and and you just go and see. Interesting. Somebody commented that the video quality just got worse. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know what to tell you guys. Uh, nothing is wrong on my end. Uh, I don't know. Looks good. Look, looks good here. Tell me if uh, video quality does not improve. Okay. But anyhow, so where was I? Color, yeah. Uh, how well does it carry your ability to see color into low light? Um, I spent a good amount of time doing that with this scope. It is broadly similar to what I got uh, with Razer Gen 2, maybe slightly better. I think it's a new, I mean, this is a new design. It's not as good as a Tangent or a Schmidt. Honestly, quite similar to the other fairly modern, uh, at least reasonably uh, modern uh, Japanese scope in the same price range, the Element Nexus that I, uh, I also have here. It's one of the scopes that you just saw. It's a 5 to 20 by 50, so broadly similar design. A four time erector, while this guy is a five time uh, erector ratio. In terms of how well it maintains contrast into low light, it is broadly. Uh, similar. Um, that's pretty good situation to be in. That roughly tells us that optically you're probably not going to find anything under, um, let's say, $2,000 that's going to beat the scope. Once you go higher, once you get closer to you know 3K, yeah, there are you know, designs here that are better. I've seen a few, uh, but under 2K, I am quite confident that optically it's going to stack up just fine against more or less anything out there, or at least anything that I have seen. It's entirely possible uh, that there are designs. Uh, it's entirely possible that there are designs out there that I have not seen. Um, when I you know, when I started looking at scopes, when I started doing this quite a few years ago, I could cover everything. I no longer can. 
And uh, the way it happens is that uh, some manufacturers are interested in, in working with me, some are not, and the market is so large that I don't have to chase anyone, right? So if somebody's not interested, I don't take it personally. You know, like they are running a business, I just talk about shit, right? So I just ignore it and uh, move on. That's pretty much it of the stuff that I do have access to. There is so much that I'm behind already. And to reiterate, optically with the stuff that I've seen, there are there's a number of designs there that have wider field of view and are substantially heavier. That taken out of the equation, there's nothing under 2K I'm aware of that is optically uh, better. Uh, now, some smart ass is going to say, oh, I can go buy a used Schmittenbender for 1999, right? Yes. If you buy a used Schmittenbender 5 to 25 for 1999, it will be optically better, twice bigger, heavier, and all that. Not, not apples to apples. And it's a used scope. New scopes under 2K. This is about as good as you're going to find. Uh, that by itself would not be uh, hugely. Uh, hugely exceptional. What is exceptional is that they managed to accomplish it in a scope that weighs less than 22 ounces, has side focus, good magnification range, front focal plane, radical, zero stop. It's a very, very full feature design that weighs less than 22 ounces and hangs with them near anything out there, anywhere near its uh, price range. And that is, uh, that is sort of a, a big deal. Uh, in terms of pure image quality, the outstanding thing is the center field resolution, which is just excellent. There is really not a ton of flare. It is well controlled. Um, does come with a sunshade. If you're not planning to put anything in front of the scope, use a sunshade. There is no real downside to it. It weighs very little and it does help with flare. But even without the sunshade, flare was really not a concern. The way the radical, I'll talk about the radical in a moment. Uh, the way the radical, the radical illumination worked, they were also well adjusted. So in low light, I did not really have uh, um, have any issues. There are some scopes out there that are known for being um, slightly finicky in terms of side focus, depth of field, how much you have to pass with the side focus and all that. Um, this scope is not finicky. It is not as forgiving as uh, tangent theta. Right, tangent is probably the most forgiving design in that regard. Uh, half the time, and don't have to touch the uh, side focus at all. Here, I do have to touch the side focus, and the way um, they set up the side focus, they are using nearly entire uh, rotation of side focus during more than 270 degrees, which gives you a lot of granularity in dialing in the distance just right. But I didn't have to mess with the distance uh, very much, and the depth of field is uh, quite forgiving for um, for typical hunting applications. You really don't need to worry about sight focus at all. Set it on 100, 150 something, and just go use the scope. You should not need to mess with it. But if you this if distances extend, um, yeah. It comes in very handy. I didn't take this very far. I took it out, I think, to 1,200 yards. Trying to remember something like that, and it worked fine. It did not really uh, give me any issues. Um, the sheep was shot at 450 yards, and uh, but you know, for a longer shot, I have time to mess uh, with the side focus. And but yet again, it's um, it's not a situation right where you grab the side turret and you start turning and you overshot it and you have to correct it. In this, the way they set up the adjustment of the side focus turret. I basically grab it and dial it in and stop somewhere near there. I don't know if it's perfect, but it's clearly good enough. Um, if I really want to spend time and dial out every possible semblance of parallax, I can for field applications. I don't really need to. This is a really, really user-friendly design uh, overall. Okay. If it's beginning to sound like I really like this scope, um, I really like this scope. Right, so it's a it's kind of funny thing. I've been uh, going around the country and nagging people to make something like this for a few years. So when uh, the, I knew that Vortex was working on something, but they would never tell me the details. And then some months ago, uh, Scott from Vortex calls me up, says, well, I've been nagging us all these years. I'm going to send you something to look at. Just don't talk about it. And that was uh, this thing. 
uh, I think I know it took a while for them to make it. Uh, they did a good job. I will be shocked if you can find this thing anywhere in stock for the next year. Um, there is really nothing quite like it. I mean, the weight-wise, the closest front focal plane scope to it is in the March uh, 3 to 24. And that is quite a lot. Uh, that's quite a lot more money. So um, that's, um, that's kind of a different ball game. And as far as overall performance goes, March is ultimately a better scope. Um, but uh, as far as user friendliness goes, uh, the three to this is a more user friendly scope than the March three to twenty four. Uh, the uh, eye relief is more forgiving. You know, larger eye box. It's easy to get behind. March is not bad. Not as bad as people say it is, but uh, the scope is more forgiving, and the side focus substantially more forgiving. A March made a four and a half to 28 by 52, which is even short, although heavy at about 30 ounces, and it has very wide field of view, and it is a good bit more forgiving than the original and all that. And that is a really, really compelling design. But A, it's a little bit heavier. B, it's I think more than double the price. I think it's like three and a half K, uh, something like that. So that's sort of a, uh, uh, that is sort of a, the basic, uh, that is sort of a basic summary, I think. Right? Yeah, that's largely it. I'm sure I've glossed over some details, and I'm sure you guys will ask me. So I'm going to start looking at uh, the comments. And uh, let's see what else comes up. All right. Let's see where we are. uh okay the very first question before this whole thing started was from jb on uh how this uh scope stacks up against the burris xtr3 in terms of build quality and stuff uh, it's gonna be pretty close the intent of the scope is very different burris built the current iteration of XTR3 as a primarily a competition scope, and it has a notably wider field of view. The XTR3 is also heavy. I think it's right around 30 ounces, so it's eight something ounces more, around eight ounces more. And uh, it magnification range is slightly different. But both are really compelling scopes. Um, I have not done a full test of XTR3 because as it is configured now, it's, uh, the reticle is quite thin. And they just don't like it. I know it works well for competition. It's not ideal for me. Uh, the moment they have an illuminated version of that thing, I'm going to get my hands on it. And one of the things I'll uh, compare it to will be uh, will be this new razor, um, because that's going to be an interesting uh, argument. I generally like this category of scopes, so I'll intend to continue looking at it. Um, you know, guys, let me refill my cup, and I will be right back. I apologize. And I am back with more water. All right. Okay, more on XTR3 from JB. I had decided on the XTR3 illuminated when released for an SPR. This may have just thrown a range into that plan. It's a good question. Um, they're both really good scopes, right? And, and uh, if you it really comes down to how much weight you're willing to tolerate and what you want in a turret so the turrets here are six mil radian per turn and once a zero stop is in it's basically two turns for me that's plenty that's the same thing i have as an tangent data that i have a ton of experience with right and uh, for me that's enough right that gets 308 to more than a thousand yards where i live for a thousand yards so at the sea level, and then I'm comfortable using the turret uh, together with the reticle. 
if you want to push things further, XTR3 with its 10 mm radiant return turrets is going to get you more and it has more adjustment range and all that. The penalty is weight. The advantage is going to be the turret travel and the field of view. I imagine uh, most other things will be broadly comparable. Slight difference in magnification range, right? So if wide field of view is going to be important for you, XTR3, if you want to have a little more magnification, a little bit less weight, um, then this is probably going to uh, take the cake. In the meantime, illuminated XTR3 is not here yet, and this is, so, you know, this is fairly simple uh, choice. All right. Okay, how does the Vortex compare to Swaro Z5i, 3.5 to 18 by 44? Kind of like uh, apples to shoelaces. Uh, the Swaro is a lightweight, really, really excellent second focal plane scope. Um, I've sort on a record for anything that requires compensating for, uh, excuse me, um, my nose itches, uh, for distance or wind. I really prefer far focal plane scope. So it's not really a fair comparison. In terms of pure optics, the Suaro is going to be a little bit better, but the difference is pretty small. I've looked at the Suaro uh, fairly carefully next to the second focal plane HDL HD scopes. And while Swarovski is a little bit better, not a whole lot in terms of bang for the buck, I'd probably take the Razor HDL HD 3 to 15 by 42 over the Z5. Now, if you are willing to spend the money, Swar is ultimately better optically and mechanic. I think they're both pretty good. I have got have several of the Razer HDL HD scopes. I have it, got zero problems with them, right? Uh, but optically, they're really, really good. There is this common myth that German optics is always better. Not necessarily. It's better because it's designed to be a more expensive scope. Once you start getting close in the price range, these guys fight for the same dollar. And in terms of bang for the buck, yeah, these Razors... Uh, that's something. They're really good. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Joe, 30 millimeter tube. Yeah, I think I mentioned it. Uh, it is a, a 30 millimeter tube. That's it. And I'll go through the comments and I'm going to put the picture of the reticle on the screen and I'll talk a little bit about the reticle and the things I like and don't like. So. Uh, depth of field. I think if I left something. If you're looking for any specific scenario, depth of field is, like I said, not as good as a tangent, but better than most. Uh... Okay. Fort Cobra. I would like to know depth of field as well and whether for tactical and hunting situations under a thousand yards. When would you get this versus a March shorty? So March shorty is a very, very different thing. March shorty is a low power variable and it's designed for something else entirely. Um, if you need one power, get a sh shorty or some other high quality low power variable if you don't need the one power if it is for everything else mid to long range engagement stuff like that this is better well, i mean you can always go to a larger march it's going to be even better yet and, uh, and more expensive if you don't need the one power don't go for a low power variable right at uh, moderate mid moderate to long range shooting this scope is excellent Pro, per ounce, probably the best. Oh. Ah, my nose itches. Is it better optically than 3 to 18 Optima 6? I assume you mean Optica 6 by me. Opti yes, it is a. I have the Optica 6, 3 to 18 by 50. It, uh, this uh, new razor is significantly lighter and a significant step up in terms of, uh, in terms of optical quality. Ooh. 
Ilya, how sad would your eyes be if you replaced the uh, tangent 5 to 25 or zero comp 5 to 27 with this scope for a crossover rifle? Optically, it's not in competition with the tangent, right? It is very, very good, but it's not a tangent. It's not a zero comp. Um, I don't have a zero comp here. I have a tangent. A couple of them, actually. Your eyes would be a little bit sad. Um, your back would be relieved. Um, it's a good question. I don't know. So for me, on the fix, it is replacing a tangent, right? So the scope that was usually on my fix uh, was this same exact tangent, 3 to 15 by 50. And uh, I have no complaints about tangent. Still my favorite overall scope design of all, really. But I'm kind of interested in some NRL Hunter shooting competitions. And I want to hunt more. And this scope is good enough. And it is lighter. And it gives me just a little bit more magnification. For what I use this rifle for, a four and a half and a low end is sufficient. I don't need to go all the way down to three. Does it mean that tangent is going to sit homeless? No, I have another rifle for it, where I think it's a better fit than the Razor HDLHD would be. Um, but um, I honestly don't know. So this scope is good enough where I'm not going to cry, but there is a difference. There is a clear difference. Uh, Brian Barrett, I have let L3 to 15 by 42 and love the clarity. I assume that means Razor HDLHT. Yeah, it is very nice. Um, all the Razor HDLHT scopes are quite nice um, and broadly comparable in terms of overall optical quality. This may have a slight edge over the, the other, of this, over the second focal plane ones, but that also could be down to sample variations. So I mean, I have all three here, so I looked carefully. This one edges them out ever so slightly, um, but um, I don't know if it will hold for any two samples you will find. Uh, Mega Gunch, the average field of view and 12 mil limited elevation makes this a niche product in my opinion rather than the crossover scope. I guess I'll keep waiting for the XTR3 elimination, at least for my use case. It's actually interesting. Um, I don't know for sure what your use case is, but I always run into this argument, right? So, um, and I actually ran into this more uh, with a tangent because I've been using this guy for a long time. And this also has, once you set the zero stop, it has two, uh, two revolutions of a turret available, which is 12 mil radian. <clears throat> And uh, I had a ton of people always complain, oh, it's not enough elevation, not enough elevation. When I talk to them, they've never used 12 mil radian ever in their life. Now, I'm not saying that you haven't. But what do you do with a scope of this type, right, without going into ELR and stuff like that? This is, it's not for that. What do you do that requires more than that, right? So I can think of um, really three applications where this amount of adjustment is not enough, right? Uh, uh, ELR, shooting really, really far away. Uh, longer range shooting with rim fire. You need a lot of drop, a lot of compensation. That's two. And the crazy thing that I do with this, much shorter, by the way, where I try to shoot fairly far away with subsonic blackout and stuff like that. Once again, huge amount of drop. I need a lot of elevation, right? So for these three precision shooting situations, this scope does not have enough adjustment. What other applications do you have where 12, 12 mil radians is not enough? Uh, it's not a fastidious question. I'm kind of curious. Okay. Uh, off topic, but I picked up a march uh, with TR1 radical based in part on your remarks uh, regarding it. It works as advertised. Excellent. Thank you. Really appreciate it. If you guys buy something per my recommendation, come back and tell me what you think. Um, I'm always curious because I make recommendations the best way I can, the best way I know how. 
but as we just discussed you know in the mega gorgeous gorgeous uh, case your application may be different if i recommend something and it doesn't quite work or it does in this case it does but especially if it doesn't uh, come back and tell me i'm always trying to learn and understand more about other applications use cases so, or did i just screw up well it happens ah Janice here. How did Japan won the mixed ping pong against China? That's table tennis. Yes, I, I, I watched the match. It was a good match. Seth Rich, could you show the March 4.5 to 28 next to the Vortex for size comparison? Yes, absolutely. Give me a moment. Yeah, and I'm going to blow my nose while I'm at it. Pardon me. Oh, bloody hell. All right, so here is the March 4.5 to 28 by 52. And here is, let's do something like this, the vortex. Can you guys see? Like this. This way, this way, like this. And this is the vortex 4.5 to 22 by 50. So March is a decidedly shorter scope, uh, larger 34 millimeter tube versus 30 on this. And the March weighs about 30 ounces. This is about 22 ounces. Both just under just under 30, just under 22, I think. Okay. One of the things, once again, I talked in a, a little bit earlier about the eyepiece. I look at the difference in the uh, eyepiece diameter. One of the reasons this has to be heavy is to maintain uh, that wide field of view. Let's talk about the eye box again. Does it have a super tight eye box like the March 3 to 24, where if you're off that center in the eye box, it just gets extremely distorted? Uh, no, this is a much more forgiving eye box. But uh, if the March gets extremely distorted, you didn't, uh, either something's wrong with it or you didn't adjust the eyepiece correctly. I have that 3 to 24 March. And once you've set everything up, there is distortion, but it's not bad. It is. Uh, tighter eye box meaning you have less flexibility for your eye but distortion is not really a major issue uh, either way this new vortex is more forgiving uh, brian so brian asked a question about swarovski unless shooting over 300 yards sfp is perfect i agree right so for if you do not need to worry about uh, trajectory compensation and wind compensation too much, although 300 need to think about wind a little bit, uh, there is FFP may be more complication than you need, right? So uh, like I said, the, the sheep I shot with this, it was at 450 yards, and uh, I view this scope as covering pretty much everything other than brush hunting. And for that, FFP is a better way to go. Joe, it sounds perfect for an accuracy-focused AR uh, that's not a total pig. Uh, yes, you're right. So when I was trying to uh, figure out where to put uh, where to put the scope, uh, I was basically choosing between the fix and the very accurate 6.5 grand AR-15 that I have. And in the end, I decided to put uh this guy the eraser on the fix because the fix is uh, uh going i'm more likely to go hunting with the fix where being a little bit lighter helps and the tangent is going to go on in ar15 uh in the six and a half grandel because i will i do use it for hunting occasionally from a blind but uh, by and large uh, I use that AR a little bit more for general purpose things and precision shooting and range stuff and a few classes and uh, stuff like that. An ounce in the morning is a pound at night when walking. I fully agree. Yeah, that's very, very accurate, especially if you're walking uphill. And by the end of the day, it doesn't matter which way you're walking, everything feels like uphill. 
Ooh, good question. Seth Rich, how does it compare uh, to the Mark V HD 3.6 to 18? Uh, so I, I unfortunately no longer have the Mark V here. Uh, I have been able to look at them side by side. Optically, it's close. Mark V is a much shorter scope. And with the arguably more sophisticated turret set up uh, where the turrets have zero stop and zero lock and both wind engine elevation lock and uh, the <clears throat> there's more uh, there's a large adjustment range you're not limited uh, to 12 meter radian stuff like that optomechanically it's pretty close uh, it is a less expensive scope than the mark V, uh, which uh, works in the razor's favor if you're trying to put a clip on or something in front of it uh, mark V is shorter uh, so that's uh, you know that's an edge for mark V. and field of view i think is um broadly comparable i think it's broadly comparable optically it's very close mechanical honestly i haven't like the couple of mark fives i tested i didn't have any issues and i didn't have uh, any issues with the razor so it comes down to what you're looking for one of the weaknesses of the mark five is that it does not offer an illuminated uh, three radical they came up with this pr1 mil pr2 mil radicals but in the Mark V, you cannot get an illuminated three radical other than that Horus abomination. Uh, so for my purposes for scope like this, I like three radicals that probably lean toward the razor. Uh, if you don't need a three radical, um, you can get a Mark V 3.6 to 18 by 44 with illuminated PR1 uh, for about 2,300 bucks. So it's $800 more than the razor kind of have to choose you know what whether that's worth the money for you or not they're both nice scopes um yeah is the radical uh usable at low magnification without illumination so <clears throat> Uh, it's a front focal plane scope uh, so the reticle does get thin in broad daylight uh, you know it looks like a kind of looks like a thin number four reticle uh, and it is usable but it is thin i don't didn't have any major problems using it in low light it does disappear so for that you will need illumination uh the way the illumination works uh there is kind of a center cross that's illuminated it actually worked uh, very nice you know what since there is a question about the reticle let's pull up what the radical looks like and let me cast that on the screen so i'm going to show you two pictures one is of a, uh, a center portion of the radical so you can kind of see what's illuminated and stuff like that and then i'll show you what it looks like zoomed out i do have a video somewhere on uh, I do have a video somewhere that I took through the scope, but it needs to be edited, and I haven't had really had a chance. I uh, haven't really had a chance to do that. Okay. So the, here's what the radical looks like. The radical is called XLR2, and um, in many ways, it's really, really similar to the EBR7, except to me, it is substantially improved all the line thicknesses the dot size and all that are exactly like in the ebr7 radical in the four and a half to 27 uh, gen 2 razor the tree is the same uh, dot sizes are the same the primary uh, aiming dot in the center is 0.04 milli radian i think yes 0.04 milli radian right the thin line up top is 0.03 uh, the thick uh, bars I'll, you know, I'll show you what those look like momentarily uh half a milli radian so it looks really really similar um the big difference if you see where my uh let me see if you should i should be able to see where my mouse is on this i hope the big difference is the is in the way the horizontal axis is treated ebr7 has very large and tall hashes which to me distract from the center of the reticle here they did more or less same thing as i did on one of my meopter radical designs uh, and made everything is a, a little bit smaller and i think it works a lot better and the eye is drawn to the center a lot better though the aiming dot 
itself is quite small at 0.04 milliradian. The way the, <coughs> excuse me, the primary stadia come to it from all four directions really helps you aim with the center at any magnification range. Even when you don't really see the dot so much, it's very, very apparent where the center is. So in practical use, it really worked uh, very, very nicely. And uh, this treatment goes uh, plus minus four milliradian on both sides. And beyond that, out to 10 milliradian, you have 0.1 milliradian hashes every 0.1 milliradian. Up top, another difference uh, between this radical and the EBR7 uh, variants is that once again, you have this illuminated uh, coarse scale for about four milliradian. You have a couple of milliradian of 0.1 hashes and it stops and beyond that, it's just a, uh, it's just a, uh, a thin line. In that, I really like on ABR7. If I remember correctly, it goes up to uh, 10 milliradian above center. I could never figure out how is that useful for me, at least uh, for anything that I do. It is not uh, terribly useful. If you look, I'm going to pull up another file. Uh, give me a moment. Is this the right file? Yeah, this is the right file. So this is sort of what it looks like uh, more zoomed out. I'm going to share another file. So this is uh, one of the kind of what it looks like zoomed out. Uh, you get a better idea what the radical looks like. And you notice that uh, another difference compared to the Razor Gen 2, they didn't illuminate the tree, which for me is good. I don't like it when they uh, illuminate the whole tree. And uh, I, they basically made it kind of an uneven cross, right? The, yeah. What that does is that uh, the illumination can get quite uh, low, so it does not really mess with you in low light. And also because you're not illuminating nearly as much stuff, it doesn't block things which you should be seeing uh, nearly as much. It basically, in on low power and low light, you have nice, mildly illuminated crosshair to aim with, which for hunting purposes, stuff like that is really, is really all you need. The tree uh this is not always on that uh, i'll make a video you guys will see it and uh, the tree really disappears at low magnification which is kind of how i like it i prefer to for the tree to not really be prominent until you get to um above eight nine power or uh or thereabouts okay if i were to make any changes honestly so they pretty much took care of almost every complaint I had with the EBR, EBR7 radical uh, in this design. And uh, the, if the only changes really that I would make, maybe I'd make the center dot a little bigger, but it works as is. Uh, I would probably make the illuminated cross symmetrical, up, down, left, right. It's not a big deal. I think it would be slightly quicker and low power. And maybe uh, on the sides, I'd bring in the thick bars in a little bit, maybe. Uh, but aside from that, I have no complaints. It's a really, really usable radical. Kind of a comparatively, not simple, but comparatively simple uh, three radical design, and it really works very nicely. Okay. All right. Let's see what our, what's next? Uh, okay. Brian, yes, it's second focal plane, always large. Uh, no, Brian, this scope is front focal plane, not second focal plane. So if price was not an object, you would go with a march of similar magnification for overall quality size weight. <sighs> I don't know. Here's a catch, right? For what? For a rifle used primarily from the bench, um, I take March 3 to 24 over this, right? Uh, if weight is not a huge concern, I take the March 4.5 to 28 by 52, and it's a better scope, you know, 3.5 grand or whatever it costs, and it's just a better scope. 
but it's also a heavier scope. If mountain hunting, western hunting is an equation, um, I take this over the March 3 to 24 because it's not quite as nice optically, but it is better set up for hunting. Uh, and it's good enough. It's clearly good enough. This is, um, you know, I talk a little bit about the inflection points, right? Where do you get the most for your money? Um, that's like around 1500 bucks, right? That's mostly it. There are several scopes like that. Once you get past that, it's a case of uh, uh, diminishing returns. If I wanted to get a the ultimate hunting rifle, a bigger argument really would be between this and the uh, 3 to 15 tangent that I already have, right? And so that's not a simple argument. This is about 27 ounces, so it's a five ounce difference. It's not that much, but you'll feel it. Except by the end of the day, you'll feel it. And you get get wider field of view on three powers, so it's maybe slightly more flexible, right? If you're talking uh, about any kind of hunting, then that's a, that's a different conversation to have. But you know, tangent is thirty eight hundred dollars. This is fifteen hundred bucks. So, the basic it really comes down to how particular you are about weight. If you are trying to get a full featured front focal plane scope. Uh, that's easy to use and as light as possible, this scope is it. There's nothing exactly like it out there. If you're not that particular about weight, that that, that definitely opens things up. Uh, but then it becomes an... Uh, the, but then you're either spending a lot more money, right? Or it becomes an argument between this and the element Nexus. And that's also not a simple argument. Uh, Nexus has a wider field of view. The sucker is lighter uh, for a... Yeah, if you need a lot of adjustment range, go with the Nexus. If you want the turrets, the most up for your big game hunting, uh, general center fire stuff, go with the Razor. Um, that's kind of the breakdown. Would you replace an NX8 to twenty for this razor? Yes, I would. I so I tested the NX8 to to twenty. I did not like that scope. I generally did not like any of the NX8s, although the four by thirty-two, four to thirty-two was better. I really like the attackers. Um, NX8s do nothing for me. So, all right. Does the elevation knob articulate physically move up and down? Does the eyepiece move when magnification is adjusted? Or does the magnification ring only move? So when I adjust the magnification ring, the eyepiece stays put. I also don't like it when the whole eyepiece rotates. When you uh, rotate the turret, I don't know if you guys can see it. I'm going to try to do my best. The turret does not go up and down. It basically stays where it is, and you're just rotating it. Whatever up and down is happening is happening internally. Okay. In that regard, that's another a potential weakness. There is no a second turn indicator. The way the turret is labeled, um, it tells you first or second turn values, but there is no second turn uh, indicator. Now, in my case, it doesn't matter too much as long as uh, you know, I have some sort of a value to work off of. Um, but uh, higher end scopes, like let's say an attention, right? So it's also fairly compact turret, but here there are little windows that tells you whether you're on the first or second turn, right? But you pay for it. Thank you, God. So 12 mils on my center fire is okay for 90% of my shooting. But for 22 use it won't be enough. I really dig my PST 3 to 15 for a crossover scope. A little more magnification, exposed turrets is what I want to improve. Okay, I think you and I probably think when you say crossover, you and I probably think about something else. So for me, for this type of a, and I agree for long range 22, there is not enough here, but um, in terms of elevation. When I think crossover, for me, crossover means uh, Practical precision shooting, PRS, NRL, NRL Hunter, that kind of stuff. Uh, Western style hunting, general purpose hunting, and accurate AR-15s. Right. So these are the three things I think of when I'm talking about crossover. 
Um, I, Arena Fire is a little bit of a world on its own, partly because if you stretch a distance just a little bit, all of a sudden you need a lot more uh, adjustment range. But uh, the weight is not that huge of a deal for you know precision rim fires, right? I don't need to stay on this uh, weight budget. Whenever something crosses over into a rifle that you're going to be hiking up the mountain with, weight becomes a big deal, right? So I think you and I, when we say crossover, mean uh, something else. I should probably uh, define it better. So good catch. Uh, is there any other drawbacks uh, from using wide reticles besides they can only be simple, such as raised one to six, compared to glass edged ones? And that's pretty much it. Now, for a long time, people kept on saying that uh, wire reticles are more fragile. It was um, used to basically nag loophole. Um, not really. Well made wire reticles are perfectly robust. The biggest difference is that with wire reticles, uh, you are limited in how sophisticated of a reticle you can use. But with a wire reticle, you can use fiber optic elimination, which is what a lot of low power variables do. And that works very, very nicely. Uh, so pick your poison. In terms of, in other ways, there's really no major downside to uh, wire reticles. My gosh, I'm the kind of person that likes to use one rifle for everything rather than six I use once a year. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, you have, chances are you're a much better shot than I am because I'm always messing with different guns and different optics and all that. But I've sort of resigned myself to the fact that uh, I like to play with stuff and that definitely inhibits my development as a shooter. But uh, from a shooting standpoint, what you do is better. Okay, JB. Hey, d -Lo, I'm in and out of this live stream due to family being in town. How do you feel this would be on a 56 gas gun SPR with an offset red dot? I had just decided to go with the Burris XTR 33218. Uh, I've, uh, I don't see why it wouldn't. So I haven't used this scope uh, set up that way, but I have used a somewhat similar, just sized, Tangent 3 to 15 with an offset red dot on an accurate Grendel. <coughs> Excuse me. And it worked very, very nicely. I don't see a particular issue. Um, you would need to decide how to set up the red dot so that the objective that doesn't interfere, but it's pretty straightforward. There's really nothing to it. Um, I should probably do a video on it. So a lot of people mount red dot sights on scope tubes and that works. But for me, that means not a 45 angle, I have to rotate it a little bit more. So there are a couple of different ways to set it up, but I don't see why it wouldn't work well. Uh, is this more ideal? Well, uh, ideal is a complicated word, right? Uh, depends on what you need. If you need the wide field of view and lower magnification, Burris is better. If you prefer lower weight, this is better. Um, I don't think you'll find much of a difference optically other than field of view. So you kind of have to um, have to pick uh, the, pick your poison. Uh, do you have to set a zero stop if not how many turns? So you do not have to set your zero stop if you don't want to. You can keep the zero stop out and I think it's got, uh, you know what, my memory is not what it used to be. I'm going to tell you right now how much adjustment range it has if uh, you have not uh, set up a zero stop. Hold on a sec. I know I have it here somewhere. I have a million files and a ton of information and i'm not as young as, you, as i used to be so i don't remember everything quite as well as i used to be i want to say it's got about 25 mil radian of overall adjustment but i really want to make sure i am not bullshitting let me see hdlht i don't have it in this file 
Mm -hmm. I think you get um, around four turns if you do not set the zero stop, but don't quote me on it. Just give me a sec and I will dig it up. I do have a manual of this thing somewhere. And is it this? No. Why do I not see it? You know what? If I can't find it quickly, I'll have to get back to you. Uh, nope. That's just marketing. I don't need that. There was a manual here somewhere, but it is not. It is not uh, set up in a way that then the file name does not scream manual to me. That's the radical stuff. No, this is disappointing. That is the radical menu. Okay. Now we're, we're, I'm getting to the manuals finally. That's another radical menu. Bloody hell. Product menu. Okay. So the total adjustment is just 22 milliradian. So it's just under four turns total. So 22 milliradian of total adjustment range if you do not uh, put in the zero stop. Sorry, it took me a little while to find it. Okay. Uh, I got the Razor's 85 millimeter spot instead of the Viper, save 400. But pay three hundred over my budget. Uh, that's a good deal. You you did good. Is that tangent you keep showing the three to fifteen hunter or the tactical? It's the tactical. It's TT three one five M, and it's one of the very early ones. It's one of the very very first batch they made. I've played with the hunter. I don't have one here, but optomechanically the TT three one five M and H are pretty much identical. How about low light? Hunting needs good glass. Lightweight and excellent in low light. So I talked about low light in some length in my early uh, beginning monologue. It is quite good in low light. Uh, no complaints whatsoever. Like I said, in terms of overall optical performance, low light and otherwise, you will not find anything better with the same objective diameter under 2K or thereabouts. Uh, on that tangent, 30 versus 34 millimeter, any preference? So once you go up to a larger tube with a tangent, it gets heavy. If it gets heavy, just get the 5 to 25, which I also have. That's oh my god, I don't have it uh, in the office here with me. The tangent I keep showing is a 30 millimeter model, TT315M. That's the model. What would be your choice optic for an HK91 without getting in the way of cocking tube reloads? Uh, I tried a, I guess, a 3X prism and it is short night relief. I have no freaking clue. Um, if 3x is short on eye relief, try one of the low power variables. My sort of default recommendation for a lot of stuff like that is just to get a striker one to six and uh, see if that'll do it for you. I'm not, I, I've never really messed with HK91, so I'm afraid I'm not to, too much help in this case. Taylor, this fits my needs exactly. Can't wait to grab one. Good. I am glad it does. So I spent so much time and effort trying to convince manufacturers, including Vortex, to make something like this, to really want this guy to be successful. That having been said, it is a nice scope. That having been said, so uh, the scope is going out now. It's being introduced this week. I've had it for six months. So this is clearly not a full production model, right? They're telling me it is identical to any production model uh, completely, entirely, and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, you know, I'm 
it's going on my list of recommendations so i am sort of responsible and i will monitor very carefully how these do when they get uh, out into the wild um, i don't anticipate any issues it's a well-made japanese scope uh, vortex qc is this quite thoroughly I and mean, i've visited vortex i know how they check the razors um, i don't anticipate any problems but who knows right um i know they already have a lot of back orders on them right so I mean, it was this, this went out to dealers not too long ago and they played a ton, placed a ton of orders so i'm hoping this design will be successful but i'll be keeping an eye on it definitely a bit jumpy here too well good like so this is a this is a really unique design in many ways Joe thinks that sounds like it solves a drop issue if you put it in a nice sloped mount. Uh, yes, if you don't need the zero stop, you, you get more uh, adjustment range. I will say this. So uh, when I checked tracking, I did not go all the way to the other edge, right? So I got it, everything set it in. I set my zero stop and I was messing with tracking from there for you know as far as it would go. I did not try to yank out the zero stop ring and... Uh, uh going across the entire range because simply because that's not how i use the scope and it's probably not how the majority of users use this scope but i will reiterate the huge advantage uh, the traction excuse me huge attraction of the scope is in what it can do at a lightweight right and you should uh, condition your choices you know based on that do you need this light of a weight now? Now, if you are trying to do everything with one scope, like say buy two of these scopes, put one on rim fire, one on center fire, or move it around, etc., this will work very nicely for you. Uh, you'll just have to you know, mess with zero stop here and there or without zero stop. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, I'm probably going to pick up a couple more of these if Vortex lets me cut in line and buy a couple, or I'll have to wait like everybody else which will be sad, but not unexpected. Um, I plan to use more than one of these because I'm really impressed with the design and I think it does a lot of things well. But I also have a lot of guns and I like to mess with a lot of different guns. And I have a few friends I need to set up rifles for. I mean, this is really, uh, barring something unforeseen, this is going to be at the top of my recommendations uh, for this kind of a crossover use for a little while. But I'm probably not going to use this for a precision rimfire. Right, so the scope that actually sits, hold on. Uh, the scope that actually sits on my precision rim fire is this element Nexus 5 to 20 by 50, right? Uh, which is broadly similar to the vortex size wise. It's a little bit longer, it's heavy, it's about 30 ounces, but it has uh, 10 mil radians per turn turrets, uh, it focuses down even closer, it was at 10 meters, and it has more adjustment range. And for rimfire, this is this works really nicely for me. Um, I'm not planning to put the HDLHT on the rimfire. I mean, a couple other things I could put in rimfire, but their overall adjustment range is always uh, at the top of my mind, right? Um, and this scope does not have a huge adjustment range, but you're right, without uh, zero stop, it's, it's, it's very serviceable. Lethal. Hi, Lee. Since you can't buy an odd mount at the moment, and one of the main attractions for the scope is the lightweight, what mount would you recommend for a 20 inch 6.5 Grandel AR? Steal the GGNG. So, GGNG is actually not bad. Uh, I really like Badger Uni mount. It's, it's not super light, but it's light enough. And uh, um, it really works nicely, and it's not hugely expensive. You know, there are a lot of mounts out there that are really, really expensive. Um, Badger uni mount is usually a couple hundred bucks, a little bit less. It's money, but it's not, you know, four hundred dollars. I'd probably uh, look at that. I may or may not have one here. Yeah, uh, but I like Badgers. Uh, they are uh, quite good. Uh, I think it's a better made mount than the GGNG FLT. Uh, but the FLT is slightly lighter, and it seems to. And I had a couple of them; and they worked uh, quite well. Uh, 
and with the mounts zero MOE or 20 MOE with 20 on the rail would 40 be too much uh, yes so 40 would be a little bit much um although maybe it depends on how you zero it but you'd end up being zeroing running right against one of the adjustment edges so 22 mil radian is right around 75 minutes of angle so if you've dialed in 40 with the you know uh, with a mount and the rail i mean you're pa ostensibly past the center you might be able to zero depending on how it all falls in but it's not going to be uh, it's not really going to be such a simple uh, such a simple thing i would not do 40. Um, this is a 20 MA mount as it sits in and that works uh, very nicely for me if i and the way and so the way it works uh it worked out on this gun i'm using a 20 moa mount and uh, i have the full remaining two turns of adjustment now uh, the you could potentially use a 30 moa amount or rail or a combination of the two to but I'm not convinced that it'll give you all that much more. I suppose it really depends on where you spend most of your time, right? While I do shoot a distance that require the entire 12 meter radian of adjustment uh, with reasonable regularity, uh, most of my time is spent inside of six, 700 yards, right? So I don't want my zero to be all the way off to the edge. At the first turn of the elevation turret is when I, where I spend most of my time and I kind of want that to be close to the center. Uh, so I probably would stick to just overall 20 MA, MOA incline if you're using a zero stop. If you're not using a zero stop, different ball game, you may need more. Uh, if you're using a zero stop, if everything lines up correctly, a 20 MOA mount gets the middle of your available adjustment range right into the optical center, and I think that's a good way to go. Uh, Jamie, how can I get your email? Um, I generally don't publicize my email too much. Uh, I have a website at darklordofoptics.com. Um, go sign up and then you can... That's pretty much the first place where I answer questions, right? So I try to... I get a lot of answer, a lot of questions uh, on YouTube, on different forums, etc. It takes a lot of time, and the volume has become so large that I set up my website. It's uh, darklordofoptics.com. It's part of the locals community. And that's uh, that's kind of the first place where I go answer questions. Everything else uh, takes second place. Uh, my kids are back. Let me go open the door. Hold on a second. Sorry about that. Uh, my nephew showed up demanding burgers. I guess the smell goes all over the neighborhood. Where was I? Yeah. Um, yeah. So darkordofopsis.com is your best bet to get a hold of me, probably. Ralph Proudfoot is here. Proudfoot, a nice Tolkien name. For all of you people who are not quite that nerdy, in Lord of the Rings, uh, at some point Frodo is pretending that his last name is Proudfoot. Only a very strange man would think of that during a gun-related live cast. But, oh, well. Uh, Robert, I shoot air guns mostly, and I find that a 20 MOA rail uh, combined with a pair of good adjustable rings allows me to adjust my scope for just about any kind of shooting i am doing yeah uh adjustable rings so there are a few out there and uh, they work much better most of them not, not all they work much better uh they work much better on uh, air guns than on center fire because there is no recoil. A lot of them that I've seen don't do quite well uh, with the recoil of center fire guns, but on air guns they do work nicely. Uh, 
uh, with a 3 to 15 tangent would the 20 plus 20 mount work so with a 30 millimeter tube one uh you will be able to get to zero it but just barely it also has uh roughly the same amount of elevation adjustment as the uh, this new razor but the way the tangent uh, the way the tangent works you cannot disable the zero stop right once you get yourself zeroed and everything zero stop is there at least that i can think of uh, so with a tangent i would also not do the 20 plus 20 approach just a single 20 moa mount is the best bet there just like with a new razor uh, hd lhd uh, doesn't look like the badger Unimount has a wait list on their website. Also, if you are looking to mount as low as practically useful, which height uh, would you recommend? Okay. So, with a, um, if you're, if you, assuming you're mounting this thing on an AR 15, and I've uh, tried this, it really depends on what's in front. Um, I'm going to switch the camera. Uh, for a little bit uh, so that you can see so the gun you're looking at there is not absolutely nothing because the camera went to sleep hold on there we go so the gun i'm gonna point it down a little bit so the gun you're looking at over there is a uh fix uh, okay that's sort of my uh, optical bench workbench so the gun you're looking at over there is the fix and it has a monolithic top rail if your ar-15 set up in the same way either with the monolithic top rail or with a handguard that has a top rail standard ar15 mount that's right around 1.4 1.5 inches is about as low as you can comfortably get if you are using uh, some sort of a uh, uh, some sort of a scope cap like the odd mount or something else because they also require a little bit of space I've tried this scope in mounts that were 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, etc., with dif different heights when I was messing with this. And I ended up using the odd mount, which is, I believe, 1. Point, uh, when I say 1.46, hold on, it should be written on it somewhere. I just can't see it because I'm getting old and blind. Something like that. I think it's 1.46 inch high but it is inclined right which uh, kind of works against you here because the objective is slightly lower uh, to the rail uh, than the eyepiece if you AR set up this way and you're planning to use scope caps you can't really go below 1.4 too easily it starts getting a little bit too close uh, for comfort without a uh, uh, without a, if you don't need scope caps, if you are running in bare, then you can get away with a 1.3 inch mount. And Badger does make a uni mount that's 1.3 inches high. I have it. That's how I know. I tried it and I, I messed with it a little bit. Okay. Hope that answers your question. And I don't remember the weight of the uni mount, but it's not very heavy. Um, shoot me an email. I think you have my email. Uh, remind me. Or remind me in the comments and I'll wait when I pull it off the gun. Robert, I've also been thinking about uh, getting Heritage Arms more, but it allows me to dial up to 150 MOA just by using the base. Have you used one of these before? And if so, what do you think about it? So I have not used the one by Heritage Arms um there are two of these that i've seen that work for precision stuff one was i think richard ivy or something like that and another one was dutch long arm some company out of holland that i've seen somewhere yes i see what you mean yeah so uh, 
uh, it's, it's a base that uses this ring. Um, for those of you like me who are not hugely familiar with this thing, I'm going to share my screen uh, to show you what Robert's talking about. Okay, here we go. Uh, about 500 bucks, and you can dial Moab as a minute of angle base. I have not used this thing. It does look interesting. I Okay, I see how they built it. Uh, with designs like this, side-to-side -side wobble can be a problem. Right, because there is a spin over there, and that's so uh, okay. I don't know. So Heritage Arms generally makes good stuff, and I would expect that they spent some time and worked out uh, the kinks with something like this. What I'm trying to find is how heavy this thing is. So most of bases like this, uh, the hell are they trying to show here? What? I don't know what they're trying to show here, but this is nonsense. I don't know what this is. Uh, anyhow, um, I don't know how heavy this thing is. One of the problems I have with some stuff like this is uh, the you start adding additional mechanical components. You start adding additional mechanical interfaces. By the time, uh, by the time you're done, uh, by the time you're done with all this stuff, it uh, you've got something that's quite heavy and uh, comparatively complicated with many more uh, with many more failure points. I'm not convinced it is particularly practical unless you're really trying to do ELR or ELR with a fire or something like that. It may be interesting to look at. I'll make a note see what I find it. Um, the very simple solution that I found that I like is uh, this thing from Tacom HQ. That's the uh, uh, Tarek Alpha, right? That's basically it goes in front of the scope. This one I use for shooting very far away with subsonics together with the March Shorty. This goes in front of it and that shifts zero without uh, dealing with any mechanical stuff. Um, it's just a precision ground piece of glass. You get it in front of the scope, it always does the same things. It does not fail, okay? Um, that is kind of a, I trust that a little bit more. I've seen so many of these fine adjustment mechanical interfaces scrub left, right, and sideways that I really, um, uh, I don't know. I'm not saying that the Heritage Arms space doesn't work. It, you know, they make good stuff, I'm sure they've, made it work i'm not convinced the solution is worth it but we'll see i'm surprised no one seems to build one like a sin plate um i don't know what the sin plate is so i don't can tell you anything about it get the erratic zero to 70. Air attack, yeah. So air attack makes actually a, a very clever solution. It's not as easily adjustable. I'll show you a picture of what it looks like. That one I like. It's also fairly peppy and fairly heavy, but it does work. And it is it works pretty well. Uh, okay, here's mounts. Air attack is a, a German company, if I remember correctly. And does a couple of very clever things. And this is an interesting mount and an interesting solution. And they do make nice stuff. It's called adjustable inclination mount. There you go. Uh, let me cast it. Uh, why is it? It's a very weird German website. That only works half the time. OK. 
Okay. Well, let me cast it so you guys can see. Why do I not see it? Oh, here it is. Okay. So this thing, right? Um, the way they do the cam here is actually quite robust and quite repeatable. It's not an infinitely adjustable mount. It has uh, increments of 10 MOA each, and you can go from 0 to 70. And you have to loosen something to change it and all that. Uh, but this does work. This mount is also heavy. Uh, whenever uh, we're talking about a scope like uh, this, uh, like the Razer HDLHT, we're trying to save weight. You save weight in the scope, add more weight with a complicated mount. I don't know if this is a solution, right? Really, but uh, the AirTag mount does work well. I've used it; uh, it works. It works quite nicely. Okay, Joe. A sim plate uses gauge pins and an inclined plane to set angles. Surface grind is used now. Uh, yeah, so this AeroTech mount that Doug mentioned kind of, well, doesn't use pins, but it basically uses a uh, eccentric uh, octagonal, I think it's octagonal, eccentric octagonal nut where every flat is slightly different offset. And uh, it's always consistent as long as they um, uh, manufacture this eccentric nut correctly. It works very nicely. All right, can't believe this. I actually got to the end of questions and it's only an hour and a half. How interesting. All right. If you guys are out of questions, which would be impressive, I am perfectly comfortable wrapping this up. Uh, let me see, is there anything else that I can show you that you guys haven't seen? Uh, I don't think so. I already did a, oh, here's an interesting thing, uh, radicals. So I made this little picture that shows uh, the EBR7C next to the uh, XLR2. And I will very briefly show it to you. Uh, and you will see what I mean. Okay. I don't know how much of it I'm supposed to publish or not. I think the official documentation comes out on Thursday. Um, but I'm hopefully Vortex is going to forgive me. The reason I wanted to show you this one is uh, look at how much is illuminated in the uh, EPR7C uh, radical and how little in the XLR2. I much prefer the XLR2 radical for general purpose use because of that. Uh, for, for pure competition use, uh, Razer 4.5-27, Razer Gen 2 4 .5 to, uh, to 27 by uh, 56 weighs 48 ounces. Razer HDLHT 4.5-22 to 22 by 50 weighs 21.7 ounces. Uh, different products for different applications. But if you are running the Razer Gen 2 on your competition gun and you want to put something like this for a rifle you are building for the NRL Hunter competition or for long range hunting or Western Mountain hunting, something like that, you will be immediately at home with the reticle. You'll be immediately at home with the way the scope looks you'll be immediately at home with the controls direction of the controls and all this sort of stuff uh, i all of the core dimensions of the two radicals are the same i don't think it's an accident i don't know for sure i don't think it's an accident i think vortex is maintaining this side picture familiarity across uh, across its product line and uh, whether you get the razor or HDLHT, or the Gen 2, or the Vortex Venom I have back there somewhere, or the Strike Eagle with the same radical, you will have some commonality to the side picture. And I think it's a very smart way to go about this. Joe, can I borrow your scope? 
Lô. Uh, one last question. What 34 millimeter rings for an optical 6, 5 to 30 millimeter radian radical? You know, um, it really depends on what you're trying to do and how high of a ring you need and all that. Honestly, it's really not difficult to find good quality 34 millimeter rings uh, these days. Uh, a lot of them are really, really expensive. I try to stay away from ultra expensive rings if I can help it. Now, if somebody wants to send me a pair of 400 for some $400 ultra fancy rings, I will not say no. Am I going to spend a lot of my money on them? No. Um, I use Burris XTR signature rings a lot. They have these plastic inserts. So depending on what I'm setting things up on, I can use that to dial in a lot of slope if I want to. And that uh, works well for me. If I'm sort of uh, on the budget, uh, I like Vortex Pro rings. Uh, the sequence vortex rings. Uh, oh yeah, there you go. He's uh, uh, saying this. Okay. Uh, sequence vortex rings are very very nice. They're also about 180 bucks. It's money. I use I've used vortex pro rings with good success. Uh, they worked. Uh, uh, they have worked quite nicely for me. And no real complaints. I've also used the UTG pro rings, and they're made in US. Uh, that are uh, they're on around sixty dollar range. I uh, have a pair of thirty four millimeter ones, and uh, they work very nice. I really can't complain. I think they're quite nice. Okay, so I hope um, that answers your question. Uh, there are a lot of uh, you know ultra expensive rings and mounts over there, and if I'm spending that much money, it better be kind of a system where I can add things to it and all that. For just a general purpose ring amount, I'm not inclined to spend quite that much. Okay. What's the TA and what's the weight? Anything else is a waste of time. Well, thank you for uh, thinking so highly of me, Brad. Uh, I've repeated the weight a good number of times. Uh, you probably just joined us, maybe. I don't know. Uh, the scope weighs 21.7 ounces. Uh, so it is the lightest full-featured FFP scope out there, just of good quality ones. And uh, the T ETA is now, I think they're officially sending these out on Thursday of this week. The way Vortex does introductions these days, they no longer announce scopes uh, well in advance. What they basically do is uh, they announce it when it's ready to ship. So it is shipping. I know a ton of vendors ordered a lot of them. They'll be going out to them in a matter of days, a few weeks at most, but probably days. Separate topic, any word on an LPVO with an adjustable parallax and one to 10 with illuminated three radical? Uh, well, so yes, depending on what you mean by illuminated three radical. Um, March one to 10 short, it does have side focus, does have parallax adjustment, and they are about to come out with a three radical. It is gonna be again, a dual focal plane design so there is a tree reticle, but the tree itself is not illuminated. What's illuminated is a center second focal plane uh, fiber dot. And then there is an edge tree reticle, right? So the, there is a tree reticle, but the, it is, but the tree itself is not illuminated, so the center dot. I'm not sure if that's uh, what you meant or not. Uh, but that's coming fairly soon, I think. Uh, I looked at the design, I liked it. I think that they'll do well with it. And to the best of my knowledge, it, they went ahead to manufacture uh, the radical design. All right. There we go. So Nate. Uh, uh, the March 1 to 10 dual focal plane is getting illuminated tree this fall. Pretty sure it has adjustable parallax. Yes, it has adjustable radical, adjustable parallax, and it is getting a three radical. 1500, yes. The price of the Razer DLHT, the map, MSRP is 2000, map is 1500. Given what the demand is beginning to look like, if I were, if I were to make a guess, I'd say 
uh, if I were to make a guess, I'd say that uh, you're not going to get much of a discount on it, but 1500 is probably what it's going to be sold for. Does the extra two millimeters on the ZCO tube thickness make a difference? So it's a, it's not really such a simple question per se. What do you mean by uh, extra? If you're talking about the tube diameter, 36 millimeter versus 34 millimeter, it depends on the design, right? So they don't design larger tubes just because you know they're compensating for something, right? Um, they need a certain amount of real estate to make their particular optomechanical design work. It's easier to get a lot of adjustment range and stuff like that with a larger diameter tube. The, the downside is that you have to make the walls a little bit thicker because uh, for resistance to dents, um, you have to make some other components a little bit larger. So there is some weight incurred and things like that. Um, does it make a difference? For their design, it has to make a difference. Otherwise, they would not do it, right? It's not, does not, uh, I don't think, uh, it's not like IUR. We went to a larger tube just to be different and to, uh, so, so that uh, people think that larger is better, right? That's the IUR 40 millimeter thing. It's, it's, not, it's not why they went to 40 millimeter. IUR has a hard time. Uh, machining and doing small micro machining, so they need, really need the real estate, right? Uh, ZCO wanted a lot of adjustment range, and they did not want optical deterioration at the edges. The scopes stay very consistent from the center to the edge, and for that they needed space. That's why the thirty-six millimeter tube. Other manufacturers, with the way they do the design, do similar things with the thirty-four millimeter tube, right? Uh, depends on your design. Okay. All right, people. I'm going to drink my water for a couple more minutes. And then if you have no other questions, that means I've covered everything really, really well. And I will go have dinner. And I've got a ton of work to do. Unfortunately, after all this uh, COVID slowdown, we were all at home for a year, year and a half. And now everything went completely insane. I'm running all over the place. And uh, that's probably why I'm getting sick all the time. It's kind of counterproductive. Finally get home and I think, okay, now I'm going to get up and come down with some virus that I just brought from the plane. The moment I recover, I have to go travel again and this vicious cycle repeats. I need to figure out how to do this. Raymond, thanks for the content. You're very, very welcome. I enjoy doing these things, and I really do appreciate all of you guys sticking around for as long as you have. Uh, I, Before I wrap up, I will remind you that my home on the web is darklordofoptics.locals.com or just darklordofoptics.com. My stuff is getting increasingly... Uh, my stuff is getting increasingly more and more centered, censored, demonetized, uh, etc. by YouTube. Um, live cast gets killed, all sorts of interesting stuff uh, happens. So I hedge. Uh, one of the hedges is that all my, all my videos are copied on Odyssey, which uh, hopefully will back things up. They also copied on Gunstreamer. Um, but my home on the internet is really going to be on Locals. Uh, it seems to be developing nicely. And I'll start doing things on the Rumble as well. Um, the way it's looking right now with all the censorship is for gun writers, for gun people like me. Our time on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram is very likely uh, numbered. Uh, we are getting silenced all over the place. I am small fish, so nobody cares really yet. But once they take out all the larger channels, uh, they'll get to people like me. I don't want to wait for it. I do plan to be on YouTube basically until they kick me out. But what happens now is, uh, you know, I talk about guns, I also talk about politics, right? And I'm only willing to moderate my content so much before I have to leave, right? Um, they are already limiting what I can say and what I can show. I can't hold a gun in my hands, for example, and a few other things. 
um, and uh, they, you know, you will not find them in a search very easily. Uh, if you are searching for a relevant contact, I don't pop up. They are all pushing people like me down in search results and stuff like that. But I'll stick around for as long as I can. Um, there will be a point where they finally push us out. So make sure you visit uh, my darklordoptics.com website. And uh, it, it to comment and talk there, uh, there is a monthly fee. It's pretty much the, uh, the barrier to keep the trolls and the idiots out. But to read, uh, most of the content is uh, absolutely free. There are some members on the things, but most of it is free. To read and get notifications, you don't need to pay anything. So please go sign up. If you do choose to support my website, I do appreciate it. You don't have to. Uh, all of my various reviews and stuff like that, they will eventually, uh, they all eventually end up free for everyone. Totally unrelated. Is the optical cement used in lenses strong enough to stick glass blocks in a concrete wall? Uh, the optical cement used in lenses is too expensive to stick anything into a concrete wall. When do you think we'll go from analog to digital scopes? Both already exist. Going to purely digital with good success is going to take a little while. But they're already here. Go use them. Tell me what you think. Uh, because of auto image stabilization, digital zoom and stuff like that. Uh, it's a longer conversation. It's doable, but nobody is doing it. And uh, there are other potential problems. I suspect uh, you know, digital scopes will get more and more development as we go along. I don't think they'll replace analog ones anytime soon. I think they'll exist side by side just fine. It's easier for digital scopes to replace lower end analog stuff. It's much, much harder to replace the nice stuff. So that's going to take a long time. Okay. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I bid you all good night. Uh, thank you for sticking me for this hour and 47 minutes. I really do appreciate it. You guys all have a good evening. Uh, if there's something I didn't cover or something that came up you want to ask, uh, do so on my website or in the comments on this video and I really do appreciate it. Thank you.